Hello everyone and welcome back to some more Football Manager 2006. This is the season highlights for the 2016-2017 season. Uh, I think it's my 12th season in charge of St Johnston and like my 4th or something in charge of Scotland. And a lot has happened. So of course last season we won the quadruple, we, we won the Scottish Premier League, the Scottish Cup, the Scottish League Cup and of course the European Cup. Fantastic, probably my best club season ever. Um, these, or this season, sorry, things were a little bit different. Loads of change happened, and as you can see, none more so than this. Uh, one of my top players, Neil Campbell, is now at Manchester United. How did it happen? All that and more coming right up. So let's not beat around the bush. Um, I didn't retain the Scottish Premier League title. In fact, I didn't even do that well, unfortunately. I really, really suffered. Similar to the previous time when I won the league. Won the league in 2011-2012. 2012-2013, okay, I came second. But I fell quite short of my points tally from the previous season. This time, I fell even lower. I fell to a third. As you can see, 12 losses is the second highest in the top six only five draws 21 wins is the most and it's obviously the 21 wins that catapult me above everyone else and as you can see 44 goals against our defense leaked goals for fun and uh, we did score the most once again but there are real concerns with going forward if we have a look at the squad i've got 46 players in the squad there are a lot of players from last season missing these are the players i signed uh, some of them, not all of them, played a part. David Underwood, for example, I signed from Braintree for 160 grand. Uh, he's played a fair bit in the season. Uh, 10 games. He managed to get himself a goal. He will probably play more of a key role next season when other players leave. Mark Freeman signed from Exeter for 200 grand. He's on loan to St Mirren. Uh, James Farrell didn't play at all, but he's a centre back. Uh, signed from Rochdale for 160 grand. Uh, Ryan Hayward, he did play a lot. He played uh, over 25 times, two goals, four assists. Not an amazing average rating, although he did get a good one in Europe. He was signed from Torquay for 325 grand. Lee Stevens signed from was it Arbroath. 70 grand, he didn't play. Uh, Daniel Nicholas, this was a guy I'd been chasing for a year, finally got my hand on him. Unfortunately, he disappointed quite a bit this season. Only a 6.5 average rating, good rating in Europe and in the Cup, so he didn't play a, a lot. But he did play a total of 21 games, only got four goals, one assist, one man of the match award. Uh, Joe Webb, signed from Aloha, didn't really play much and he's on loan at Clyde. Uh, Joe Ward was signed from Marine on a free. He's injured currently, did play. Uh, a lot of these players are players from the fu uh, for the future. Although the problem is, I've got a, a heavy on defensive midfielders and right wingers, which is a real issue. Here's another right winger, Paul Gilfin, played once off the bench, did get an assist. Hopefully he'll play a key role next season. Charlie George signed from Scunthorpe for free. He did manage to play 16 games this season. 7.1 uh, average rating. Did pretty well. Uh, Simon Anderson was signed from Montrose. He didn't really play again. Another defensive midfielder. Ah, so this is the big one. So basically, halfway through the season, I realised I had to get rid of some players. Because the stadium, which... My stadium was actually upgraded, as you can see. It used to be 10,000, it's now 13,000. And we're hopefully going to upgrade it even more uh, going forward. I'll keep you posted if I'm still on a job. Because we've got such a low stadium capacity, we always make a loss every single season. And I was going to offload some players so that the young prospects could come through. And that started here. So I signed this guy, Chris Campbell, from Ipswich. My scout said he was a good player. And he looks like he's a good player. I offered Ipswich one million. They didn't want to know. Uh, I offered them one million and a player. They didn't want to know. And then I offered them one million and two players. And they were like, yep, that's fine. We'll take it. Uh, the two players I offered were Carl Rose and Ryan Walker. Now, the reason I offered Carl Rose was because we had the Ryan Hayward guy coming in as an actual replacement. The reason I offered Ryan Walker was I had one or two uh, hot prospects coming forward in the striking positions so the two of them ended up in the Premier League at Ipswich Ipswich got relegated but they still managed to play the Premier League Ryan Walker played 17 games scored six goals in the Premiership fair play but the issue occurred because of a certain clause there was a clause in Carl Rose's contract that said his former club which was Rochdale would get 
uh, 45% of the transfer fee. Now, in a part exchange deal, there's no transfer fee. But apparently, I was supposed to be receiving a fee for getting rid of these two players. But obviously, you don't. Like, I was paying one million to these two players, and in return, I was getting a player. That's as far as it goes. But for some reason, the game interpreted that I was actually going to get money. And as a result, uh, when the transfer went through, I obviously paid a million to Ipswich. I gave them the two players. I got Chris Campbell from Ipswich. And then, out of nothing, Rochdale got nine... Was it Rochdale? I th it wasn't Rochdale. Hang on a minute. Yeah, okay, it was Preston. So he was on loan at Rochdale. But the point was, Preston got nine million out of absolutely nothing. The thing is, though, I never got the actual fee. So they got the cut of a fee that didn't exist. So I ended up paying them nine million out of absolutely nothing. And I got nothing in return, or nothing on top of that. So I made a loss of nine million halfway through the season because of a glitch, and I was running out of money fast. It went down to, I think the balance was at like four million or something at one point, and I panicked. If it went down any further, you know, we'd end up making a loss. And at that point, I think we're still in all, like spoilers, we're still in all the cup competitions. So, you know, things were all right, but if we got knocked out of the cup competitions, then money would be scarce and so I decided what I was going to do was just start offloading players to cut the wage bill and to get you know transfer fees in so that's what we ended up doing and it was all because of that glitch also the other thing I was going to say was actually I created a backup and I actually joined Preston as manager and I saw that their their wage bill was over they were in debt prior to the transfer going through but after they got the nine mil, they were all good. So the money actually did reach the, you know, the Preston bank account, as it were. So that was a real nightmare. Um, so what I had to do was, I wasn't, like, I probably didn't have to do it, but I felt kind of forced into doing it. I had to get rid of players by any means necessary. So Anderson went to Braga for free. He actually played um, some of the season already. As you can see, he ended up playing 11 games, got two goals. Didn't have a good average rating, though which I, I noted, and that's why I kind of had him for leaving. Carl Rose played 12 games, one goal. Ryan Walker, who was also part of the exchange, played eight games. He got three goals, incidentally, two assists, 7.25 average rating. Then I got a fee for this guy, Rob Bar uh, Baker. You might remember him from last season. West Brom came in and offered one million, and I was like, yep, you can have him. He played one game for us. I'm unhappy that I had to get rid of him without actually playing him. But, you know, I've got so many defensive midfielders and they offered one million for a player that had barely ever played for me. So I thought, yep, that's fine. The only player that I could actually sell for a substantial fee was Neil Campbell. Uh, I tried to sell other players for a substantial fee. Nobody wanted them. Neil Campbell, who I wanted to keep, was the only one I could sell. I wasn't forced to sell him, but... I felt it was best, so he joined Man United for 5.25 million. I wanted 10 million. They wouldn't budge. Uh, it was between him or uh, Man United or Liverpool, and he chose Man United. I sold Cabral for free to Zaragoza. The reason I sold him was because he was on 22 grand a week. Yeah, same as this, 22.5 grand a week, and that had a yearly wage rise on it. So. I just wanted to get him out of there before the wage bill went through the roof, basically. I then sold Carlos for free to Real Sociedad. Uh, that's where he's ended up. Uh, oh yeah, Cabral played, or sorry, Neil Campbell played how many games for us? He must have played half the season. Yeah, 17 games, 3 assists. See, he was doing amazingly 7.4 average rating. Uh, Cabral played uh, 17... Pl Cabral played over 20 games, 4 goals, 2 assists. He actually scored his 50th goal for us this season, so he's been around a long time. And Carlos played nine games, got a decent... So they all had decent ratings, that's part of the problem. So our squad was decimated of key players. These are Cabral's stats, I should say, from his time at St. Johnson. He's definitely one of the best, well, best in terms of stats, maybe not so much best in terms of consistency. So the player that I ended up getting from Ips Ipswich, I ended up putting out on loan uh, for... 2.5 million. Arsenal came in and I said, yep, you can have him, but only for 2.5 million. So that's where, so 8.75 million, that's close. I, I almost made up the 9 million from transfer fees. I was close. At the end of the day, I, I kind of made up the deficit through selling players. The reason I did it was because I had young players coming through. And then obviously the other transfers that you saw here were all youth players. I do end up selling a lot or releasing a lot of youth players because they're just not good enough and I don't have the space or the money to spare. So in terms of appearances, we're not going to go through it too much. If there's any newer players, I'll show you them. For example, uh, where is he? This guy, David Lamont. He's a striker 
who's actually declining a wee bit, but he came through our youth system last season. He played in 18 games this season, got 6 goals, 2 assists. 6.83 isn't great, but he is only 17, so hopefully he'll develop into a really good player. And that's the thing that's worth mentioning. If you have a look at all the players that played this season, if you look at the nationalities, a lot of Scottish players, a lot of English players, one or two foreigners in there, um, but a lot of these players actually came through our youth academy. I've already said that in previous episodes, I'll say it again, um, but there's also more people coming through our youth academy now, so it's it's really good to develop a squad in this way and not just you know, spend five million on a, on a Brazilian, which I've already done in uh, this series. If you have a look at the average rating, you can see that Jonas Johansson was top again. Jorgensen's up there. He was our first choice keeper this season because our other keeper who did well last season just wasn't at the races. Yep, Davor Tolic. He only got 6.83. A lot of people over seven, but there was also a lot of people under seven which wasn't great. In terms of goals, uh, Yaya actually never played the full season. He had a drop in form, but I dropped him out of the team completely. Enzo scores and managed to end the season with 23. Uh, David Mazio played his part. Uh, David Lamont, or David Lamont. Nick Hill got a few. So did Martin Brown. These are obviously people that came through my academy. Uh, Daniel Nicholas from Hibs, he got a few. And Nathan Dykes got some as well. Andy Jack. Well, you can see the scores there. You don't need me to read them out. You can see you've got the most assists. Luis Rafael, who's actually on his way to Tottenham. His contract was up. He's 30. I just kind of thought, yeah, get, get him out of here. Actually, his birthday's in a few days, so it's going to be 31. So, yeah, he did play... Uh, 19, 20, 21 times this season, 4 goals, 10 assists. I should probably have played him more, but we will definitely miss him next time. Uh, Yaya, Johansson, Derek Stewart, they all got up, they were up there with the assists. Jonas Johansson, what can I say? 13 man of the match awards. And he's actually the oldest player here now. Jonas Johansson, Yaya, Luis Rafael, even Enzo scores to an extent. They are the four veterans of the team. Uh, but he's probably going to be leaving next season. He's got one year left on his contract. I'm going to try and get a fee for him. I don't really want to, but he is 32 now. He'll be 33 next season. He's been at the club for 10 years. I might try and keep him for a testimonial. But he's been here for 10 years. Look at that. Unbelievable stats. He's been a really good player. So Derek Stewart was a player in my reserve squad who I promoted. He actually played really well. His stats won't show it. But I thought, let's play him, see how he does. He got 7.05 average rating, which isn't bad. He got three goals, some from the penalty spot. He got six assists. Another player I want to show off was Steven Anderson. Uh, okay, 6.92. His stats, if they were one or two higher, he'd be amazing. Like an amazing all-round uh, midfielder, but I'm trying to keep him. I gave him a new five-year deal, which is stupid, honestly. But I tried to keep him around in order to try and boost his stats a bit. We'll see if that happens. Uh, but he played 12 games, 6.92. Is it amazing? But I think he did all right. Let's have a look at the Premier League awards. Uh, Jonas Johansson got Football Writers Player of the Year for the fourth year running. Uh, goal of the season was actually scored by Enzo Scorza. It was a bicycle kick, an overhead kick. And I actually, even though it was 2D, I knew it was an overhead kick because of the way he was running, the way the trajectory of the ball went after he hit it and the way it was going before uh, he hit it. I'll show you the goal now. And it really does look like it, even though it's in 3D, uh, 2D. Sorry, wish we could see it in uh, 3D, but that wasn't around in the game at this point. Uh, but yeah, unbelievable strike from Enzo Scorza. That was goal of the season. Manager of the year, I came third. Didn't deserve it. I didn't even deserve to come third, to be honest. But there you go. I got manager of the month twice. Player of the month was won by Enzo Scores at one point. Uh, SPL player of the year for the fourth year running was Jonas Johansson. Uh, that's goal of the month. Team of the year. The only player in team of the year was Jonas Johansson. Surprise, surprise. Uh, nobody got in the top three of that. Steven Anderson and David Underwood both got awards for Young Player of the Month. And nobody got Young Player of the Year. The final thing I want to speak about before we go and look at the games is the offside rule. So basically, if we go into the tactics, actually, the offside rule is different. Basically, imagine this is uh, an opposition defensive line, okay? And this guy here is the striker. So, obviously, to be offside... The ball has to be played forward, you have to be in the opposition half, and you have to be beyond the last defender, basically. So that's offside, that's onside. Uh, however, after this game was released, sorry, there was a change in the rule, which has obviously been around for a long time now. Everyone will be used to it, but it's the interfering with play rule. So basically, 
if a player's here offside and then another player's here onside, imagine the ball's played from this wing over here. This guy doesn't touch it. This guy runs onto it. It's good because this guy was onside. This guy was offside, but he wasn't interfering with play. That's the rule now. That's the rule we're all used to. But back when this game was out, the rules were different. If the ball was played and anybody whatsoever was offside, then it was offside, regardless of whether the ball was played down this side of the pitch or this side of the pitch. It didn't matter. Even if a player wasn't interfering with play, even if the ball was passed miles away from them, it didn't matter. They were offside. And I, I got quite confused about that. And I saw in a YouTube video, I, I can't remember, I think it was a YouTube video about the offside law. And that's when I learned it. I was like, ah, that's why. Because I, I kept thinking the game was getting it wrong. But it was just the rules at the time. So let's get on with the fixtures. I won't be showing you as many goals this time around, just because we don't really have the time. Uh, but let's get into it. So five or six preseason games. Paris Saint Germain preseason fairly was interesting because my my squad was still on holiday, so I had to play a team full of sixteen. Uh, 15 and 16 year olds and that, so yeah, whatever. Anyway, we drew with Torquay, lost to Exeter, beat Steros Muir, lost to Sheffield Wednesday, uh, or Chef Wed, and then we beat B Braintree to uh, complete our pre-season friendlies. Then, first game of the season, beat Kilmarnock 2-1. Yaya getting a double, someone was set off, which obviously helped. They then scored straight after, interestingly. Over 12 losses, these were the first two. Lost to Cali 3-2. Lost to Aberdeen 2-1. I don't think we deserve to win either game. And it's quite unfortunate because I'm not sure if it's players' motivation or if it's teams setting up differently against me. I think it's probably a bit of both. Um, but it was it's just really unfortunate that we were just so bad in the league this year. We then managed to beat Celtic 2-1. Uh, Jason Edwards, uh, Jason Richards, sorry, scored an own goal. Neil, Neil Edwards did equalise. Anderson put us ahead with a penalty. Then it was time for the European Super Cup against the winners of the UEFA Cup, Hertha Berlin. Hertha missed a penalty, although that was in, on 90 minutes. Enzo scores a puts ahead after 9 minutes. Anderson then netted a penalty on 68 minutes and we managed to win our first trophy of the season. Unbelievable stuff. People don't really rate this trophy, but I really wanted to win it just because, like, we may never win the European Cup again and so it's our one chance to win this trophy. We might as well go for it. I played a strong team and yeah, we came out on top against the UEFA Cup winners and they're actually above us in the European rankings so they weren't, they're no bugs. After that, we lost 3-0 to Motherwell. Unbelievable. Uh, we then beat Morton 2-0 roared back into form. Uh, Joris Johansson and Ryan Walker both got the goals in that game. And then it was time for our defence of the Champions League. And that started off with a 4 a win against Bronby. Uh, Bronby? I, I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm just going to go with Bronby. David Mazio may open the scoring on 20 minutes. He then doubled his goals tally on 33 minutes. Uh, Neil Stewart, who's one of our uh, young players actually, he scored on 82 minutes and Richard Thornton netted on 90 minutes. And I'll just show you Neil Stewart's profile here. He is a, one of the young players. As you can see, he's improving a lot. He might be in the team next year. Watch this space. Following our amazing 4-0 win against uh, Bromby, we then beat Airdrie United 2-1. Luis Rafael and David Underwood both got the goals in that game. We then beat Wraith Rovers 2-1. As you can see, it was 1-1. And Enzo scores and managed to net a 90th minute winner, which I'll show you. It wasn't spectacular, just thought I would show you it, uh, but that gave us a vital three points in the League Cup against First Division side Wraith Rovers. I completely forgot they were a First Division side. Following the Wraith Rovers game, we beat Dunfermline 2-1, Cabral and Yaya both netted, and then it was time for our next Champions League game. This was against Panathinaikos. Ryan Walker netted a penalty on 28 minutes, having missed one on 10, and Andy Jack netted our second on 68. They did pull one back but to no avail. Following that, 0-0 draw against Rangers. Uh, let's just take a quick look. Yeah, we deserve to win. But that's what I mean. Teams set up defensively. Even big teams like Rangers set up defensively against us these days because we're not only powerhouses of the Premier League, but powerhouses of Europe. Anyway, we beat Gretna 3-0. Uh, Martin Brown netted on 21. Uh, he then netted a penalty and Carl Rose completed the scoring on 84 minutes. Vital three points there. Uh, following that, 2-1-0 wins. First one was against Livingston. Cabral with the goal. Second one was against Real Madrid, as you can see. It was a Sergio own goal. 1-0 home win against Real Madrid was unbelievable. And that puts top of the group with maximum points and a really good goal difference. We then beat Kilmarnock 2-0. Luis Rafael and Nathan Dykes both scored. It was our second 3-2 defeat to Cali Thistle this season. 
Uh, the goals in this game were scored by Martin Brown and Yaya. So that was our first defeat for quite a while. As you can see, our defensive record was actually pretty good. Between the 3-0 loss to Motherwell and the 3-2 loss to Cali, kept a load of clean sheets, only conceded a maximum of one goal, which isn't bad. We then drew 2-2 with Real Madrid in the Champions League to take our goals, our points tally to 10. Diego Tardelli put them 1-0 up. Uh, we turned it around, though. Nick Hill netted, as did Enzo Scorza, but then Sergio equalised with four minutes to go. And then following that particular result, we beat Aberdeen 4-1. I don't really remember this game, but... There you go. Enzo scores a netted on 32 minutes. Uh, Nick Kill then netted on 52 minutes. Uh, Enzo scores a netted again to make it 3 0 on 57 minutes. Lose Guy pulled one back a few minutes later, um, but Andy Jack sealed it with a penalty kick on 87 minutes and they had a player sit off, presumably for a last man foul that led to the penalty. So following the Aberdeen game, it was time for our League Cup quarter-final tie with Celtic. We, of course, we beat Wraith Rovers in the last round. We managed to beat Celtic 3-1. Uh, Luis Rafael netted in the second minute. Enzo scores then put us 2-0 up on 11 minutes. And Andy Daniels equalised on 26 minutes. It stayed like that until 6 minutes to go when Luis Rafael netted our third and his second. A few days after beating Celtic, we then lost to Celtic in the league. Uh, they went... Actually, we went 1-0 up. It was 3-1 at half time. Enzo scores has scored for us. David Mazio made it 3-2 and then they scored to make it 4-2. And this was all with like 10 men, so keep that in mind. We're 10 men from basically half time. Bron Bay managed to beat us uh, away from home in the Champions League with a third minute strike. Uh, we didn't really deserve much from it. We had slightly more shots on target, but what that meant was Bromby were now level on points with us after we dropped points against Real Madrid uh, at this, uh, Bernabeu and away to Bromby. We were now level on points with them and we had to win our final game. We had a better goal difference, it meant we had to win our final game in order to finish top of the group. 1-0 win over Morton, Ryan Walker with a goal. Easy as you like. Uh, we then gained revenge over Motherwell with a 3-1 win. Cabral netted, as did Martin Brown from the penalty spot, as did Paul Barnes. Who's Paul Barnes? That is Paul Barnes. He's another youth player. He's 20. Uh, he's been at the club for five years. He's only played three times this season. Will you see more of him next season? We'll have to wait and see. So after the Motherwell win, we thrashed Panathinaikos in our final Champions League group stage game 5-1 uh, Carlos Fernandez was sent off that is our former keeper if you didn't know he played for us for four seasons before we sold him on but yeah he got he kindly got sent off for us uh, although we were winning at the time anyway Daniel Nichols scored on four minutes Martin Brown doubled our advantage on 11 minutes Daniel Nichols scored again on 28 minutes to make it 3-0 they did pull one back through Paolo Costantini. Uh, and then, after half time, it was 3-1 to us. Carlos Fernandez was set off in 53 minutes. Uh, Daniel Nichols missed his chance for a hat-trick by missing the penalty, but didn't matter. We were still 3-1 up. And David Lamont made it 4-1 and 5-1 with strikes on 57 and 75 minutes. A vital three points to set us top of the group. So with our Champions League group all said and done, it was time for the World Club Championship and... If I've titled this episode the way I'm planning to, then it will already the result will have been spoiled for you. Um, but it's a competition that people don't really rate. European teams usually go into it as the favourites, although, to be fair, the European team hasn't always won. We get a bye from the first round. Well, I'll, I'll show you, okay? So these were the two results. First game was against Auckland City, who are obviously a team from New Zealand. Uh, we steamrolled them 9-0. Again, keep in mind, this was with my original team. Like, the whole point of this season was to try and keep the team from the quadruple season together until at least the World Club Championships. Gary Stewart opened the scoring in 15 minutes. Daniel Nichols then doubled our advantage on 24 minutes. Enzo scores have gotten in the act on 33. Nathan Dykes netted on 35 minutes. Martin Brown netted a penalty on 40 minutes. And then Craig Grant made it 6-0 at half time. Kevin Christie helped us out with an own goal on 52 minutes. Gary Stewart became the only player in the game to net a double when he scored on 70 minutes and Anderson scored on 86 minutes to send us through to the World Club Cup final. 9-0. Not bad. Oh yeah, they had a player sent off on 84 but the game was done by then. Oh, and Martin Brown also missed a penalty so it could have been... It could have been 10. You lucky Egypts, it could have been 10. And that sent us through to the final against Cruzeiro 
from Brazil. They were actually the Brazilian Ronaldo's first club. We managed to win 2-0. A double from Andy Jack in the second half on 51 minutes and on 70 minutes meant that we were crowned champions of the world. World champions. It's an unbelievable feat to have accomplished at least. Because that's the thing. It doesn't seem like it means much but in actual fact you are effectively champions of the you know of all the continents of all the continental winners you are champions okay the european teams generally expected to win but we did it with you know scottish players as well how many scottish players did we have one two three four five six yeah six scottish players anyway i'll show you how the club championship uh, went so the first round is all continents bar Europe and South America. So Shivas lost on penalties to Auckland City, which is kind of good because they're probably stronger in theory, would have given us a tougher challenge. And then this Nigerian team, N Enimba, lost to uh, this Yokohama team, this team from Japan, Yokohama. Uh, we can't click on that. We, we can't click on this team. I've never heard of this team before. Do they have any good players? Who was their top player? He's not bad, you know. I doubt I'll be able to get a work permit for him, but he's not bad. Anyway, so that was the first round, and then it obviously it goes into the semi-final, and that's where we beat Auckland City, Cruzeiro beat the Japanese team from Yokohama, and then the final, obviously we won. But there was also a fifth-place playoff for Shivas and the Nigerian team, and then Yokohama managed to win the third-place playoff against Auckland City, so there's a you know, first to sixth in terms of continents. It was Europe, then South America, then Asia, then... Uh, Oceania slash Australasia although to be fair it should be called Oceania because Australia played the Asia Confederation I'm fairly sure and then uh, North America 5th and Africa 6th so that's how the World Club Championship works excellent to win it and at this point in the season we were holders of 6 trophies we were holders of the SPL, the Scottish Cup the Scottish League Cup the European Cup the European Super Cup and the Club World Cup, the World Club Cup, whatever you want to call it. Adding to the fact that as Scotland, we were holders of the World Cup as well. The only cups I was missing was obviously the Confederations Cup and the European Championships, but whatever. Aside from those, I was basically the holder, the sole holder of all the major competitions and a few kind of minor competitions. Not bad, not bad going. And I even took a screenshot of the ball with, you know, holders St. Johnston at the top or Scotland for the World Cup. So after the excitement of the World Club Championships, it was time to get back to league duty. And we lost 1-0 to Airdrie. And then we lost 1-0 to Rangers. It wasn't great. Uh, thankfully, we managed to beat Gretna 2-1. Uh, goals, both goals came from Enzo Scorza in this case. And we then managed to beat Cali Thistle, having lost to them twice in the league. We managed to beat them in the Scottish Cup third round. Uh, the goals scorers were Cabral and Yaya. Following that, we then managed to beat Dunfermline Athletic 3-1 in the league. Angel scores have got double. Andy Jack also got in on the act. And uh, following that, we thrashed Livingston 6-1. I'll show you the goals from this because Enzo scores did end up getting a hat-trick. Nick Hill got a brace on his own as well. Uh, Livingston took the lead, but Nick Hill equalised on 22 minutes. Enzo scores a... Uh, Made it 2-1 on 26 minutes, 3-1 on 31 minutes, and then he made it 4-1 on 44 minutes to complete his hat-trick. Uh, John Fitzgerald was sent off for them on 45 minutes, and Nick Hill converted the penalty on the stroke of half-time to make it 5-1. And then scores just went and made it four uh, goals for him, six goals for us on 71 minutes. And gave us, well, it's the three points that most important, but it was nice to see scores getting four goals and us to score six because believe it or not okay well next game we beat Kilmarnock 2-1 which was fantastic they went down to nine men uh, ten men sorry at half time Ryan Hayward scored for us and then they scored and then like two minutes later we scored through Chris Lawson he's actually another player that's pretty good um, he also came out of our youth academy got a single goal this season his average rating isn't good he is rated by the staff though he's showing signs of developing into a good player the problem is is that natural fitness ain't great but he can play on the wing he can play down the middle we then managed to beat Cali Thistle 3-1 in the league goals from Dykes Derek Stewart from the penalty spot and Scorza I think we then mugged Airdrie off in the League Cup semi-final we were second best to them throughout they took the lead in the first half but then David Lamont and Derek Stewart both scored to make it 2-1 
and to give us a place in the League Cup final for the second season running. And then following that, we made it through to the next round in the Scottish Cup. 1-0 win over Hearts, Ryan Hayward with a goal. They did miss a penalty through our former player, John Anderson, which was quite interesting. Um, but yeah, he plays for Hearts now. I should say, throughout the league campaign, we did we were challenging for top uh, spot. We were actually top for a couple of weeks, and mainly second. It was only, well, obviously, laterally, we dropped off, as you can see here. We'll come to that in a minute. Uh, but right at this very moment, we were... We're making ground. We're doing pretty well. A quadruple was looking like a real possibility. However, keep in mind that this is around the time when we've got rid of all of our the players I showed you. You know, your Cabrals, your Neil Campbells, Ryan Walker, Carl Rose. They're all gone, basically. And I'm relying on youngsters again. Youngsters who are good. Are they really good? Hard to tell. Now, we did win so many games in a row after losing to Rangers. As you can see, we conceded at least one goal in every game up until the Hearts game. Hearts were actually relegated from the first division this season. Uh, but the problem was we weren't winning convincingly, well, apart from the Livingston game. I always felt like we are making hard work of things. And that showed in the Motherwell game where we threw a two-goal lead uh, in the last 20 minutes. And for the second time in succession, we conceded three to Motherwell at Fir Park. Uh, but we had a last 16 Champions League tie against Olympiacos to take our mind off the Motherwell game. And did it take our mind off the Motherwell game? Yes, it certainly did. We lost 1-0. It was away from home, to be fair, but didn't really help uh, morale all that much. So we had to quickly collect ourselves for the next game, a 2-1 home win over Morton. They did take the lead after one minute. That's why I found a lot of teams would take the lead and I had to somehow motivate my players to get them back into the game. In this case, Scorza and Thornton got in on the act and uh, got us the three points in the end. And following the win against Morton, we then uh, narrowly beat Kilmarnock in the Scottish Cup quarterfinal. They did have a player sent off. They were the better team before Jack Douglas was sent off. Daniel Nichol uh, Nichols managed to net on the stroke of half time. As you can see though, they did pretty well, despite being down to 10 men. So after getting lucky in the Scottish Cup quarterfinal, we got lucky once again in the Premier League with a 1-0 win over Airdrie. Uh, David Lamont netted with two minutes to go. To be fair, we did deserve to win that one. It would have been a travesty if we hadn't, but we had to rely on a late winner to do so. Then it was time for the second leg of our Olympiacos tied, the last 16 of the Champions League, and we did the job, 3-1. Uh, David Lamont netted on three minutes. Problems occurred on 21 minutes when Edgar Sosa uh, made it 1-1, giving them an away goal, meaning we had to then score three in order to progress. Thankfully, we did just that. Nathan Dykes made it 2-1 uh, to us on the night, 2-2 on aggregate on 43 minutes, with David Mazio coming up with a winner on 56 minutes, and we managed to hold out for the rest of the game giving ourselves a 3-1 win on the night, 3-2 on aggregate. I breathe a huge sigh of relief as we're through to the quarter-final of the Champions League. Um, yeah, things didn't really go well after that. We lost 2-0 to Dunfermline. Managed to beat Aberdeen 1-0 with a penalty, early penalty from Nick Hill. And then it was time for the League Cup quarter-final, which, well, we unfortunately lost on penalties to Inverness. So they were the better team for most of the game, pretty much up until we scored. We got a goal out of absolutely nothing, and then... After that, we were the better team throughout extra time. We were the better team, but couldn't find a way through, and we just left it too late. Not enough shots on target, and I didn't have enough good penalty takers on the pitch. And the score wasn't actually 4-3. It was like, I think, 4-2 to them, or 3-1 to them, or something like that. Either way, we lost in the final of the League Cup. I think that's the first time we've come runners-up in that competition. Anyway, we had to pick ourselves up for the next game. A 1-1 draw against Gretna. Not great. Uh, we rely Well, we had to rely on a David Mazio equaliser in the final minute to get us the point from this game at Radio Park. And then following that, we had our Champions League quarter-final tie, this time against Liverpool. Of course, last year it was against Arsenal, another English team. Uh, we did actually really well in this game. We seem to do well in Europe because teams are pro probably underestimate us. Uh, Enzo scores it open the scoring on 11 minutes, giving us a vital goal at the cop end. Actually, was that at the cop end? Yeah, yeah, I think it was at the cop end. Either way, Enzo scores it gave us the lead at Anfield, uh, or new Anfield as it is now. Oh, so that's probably not the cop end. Uh, whatever. Anyway, um, Dave Williamson scored for Liverpool with three minutes to go, which was really, really annoying. Very frustrating, but... It didn't change too much because it still meant that we had the away goal going into the second leg. Following the Liverpool game, we then lost 1-0 to Celtic in the Premier League. We then lost 
by the same scoreline to the same team in the Scottish Cup semi-final. And so we could no longer defend our Scottish Cup title. 2-1-0 defeats to Celtic. Very, very disappointed with that. Um, but good news around the corner. We managed to draw 0-0 with Liverpool uh, to get to the semi-finals of the European Cup for the second season running. Um, I pretty much just set up defensively. I just I decided we're going to be left exposed. Like Liverpool had really good players. Xabi Lodz with five pace. Uh, Robert Huth with 16 pace. Um, yeah, this is a crazy game. Reina, Pepe Reina at 34. Felipe Sendros. That was a weird thing though. I was playing David Mazio as the target man up front against Felipe Sendros. You know, 184 centimetres, 19 heading, 17 jumping. And then Robert Huth, 191 centimetres, 18 heading, 17 jumping. It was like... It was a proper battle uh, in the air. But we held out to get to the semis of the Champions League. I then decided to go defensive against teams in Scotland for whatever reason. And it worked. Uh, well, it worked in this game. We went defensive the whole time. And then David Lamont nicked a winner uh, on 90 minutes. Following that, we then nicked yet another winner. This time against Livingston. A David Mazio free kick saw us get three points from this home game. Things then went sour as we ended up drawing 0-0 with Inverness. Couldn't quite get a winner in that game. Four clean sheets in a row though is pretty cool. Problem is, we'd only scored two goals in our last, like, six games. Anyway, we managed to beat Werder Bremen 2-1 in our Champions League semi-final first leg game. Uh, two away goals which are crucial. Daniel Nichols managed to open the scoring on 26 minutes. Andy Jack doubled our advantage uh, on 68. However, four minutes later, uh, Steen managed to claw one back for Werder Bremen. And I remember thinking uh, after Andy Jack scored, I was like, yep, 2-0. They'll have to score three to win in the home leg. Unfortunately, that deficit was cut by Steen. But we still had two away goals going into the home leg, which is all I needed. We managed to draw 0-0 with Celtic. I say managed to draw 0-0 with Celtic. This was actually post-split games now. The Inverness Cali was the first post-split game. Celtic were ahead of us by like, I don't know, four, five, six points or something like that. We had to beat Celtic basically to have any hope of winning the league. Uh, we didn't, and Celtic remained in the driving seat. It didn't hand them the title, but it just made it nigh on impossible for us. Anyway, we got through to the European Cup final for the second season running. Uh, we managed to beat uh, Werder Bremen 2-1 on aggregate. As with the Liverpool game, uh, I went fully defensive against them, um, and it worked. David Mazio up front, providing a bit of a goal threat, although he didn't really score, so yeah, so much for that. They were the better team, but we managed to hold out and in the end come away with another final appearance in Europe's elite competition. As you've noticed, things weren't that good for the last half of the season. The amount of goals we scored, like, look at that. We scored two goals against Werder Bremen. That was the only time we'd scored more than one goal since our game against Olympiacos. So we hadn't been scoring an awful lot. I had brought Yaya in for a few games, but he wasn't playing as well as I hoped. Neither were my other strikers. And as you can see, we're drawing blank a lot, which isn't great. Teams setting up very defensively against us, so tactics are probably to blame. The good thing is, we are very strong defensively. So many clean sheets, especially in Europe. Only one goal conceded at times, although that's obviously not enough in 1-0 defeats. Uh, the only time we actually conceded more than one goal after the Motherwell game was against Dunfermline. Uh, that all went out the window in the next three games. We basically not only lost the league, but we lost second place as well, which means we're going to have to qualify for the Champions League next season. We actually almost dropped to fourth. Basically, uh, we lost 3-1 to Motherwell. Scorer in that game was David Mazio. Uh, we then lost 2-0 to Killy. And that's what I think put them ahead of us. And then we lost 3-1 to Rangers. We should have beaten them. Well, no, we should have beaten them. Enzo scores to put us 1-0 up after two minutes. Mick Richardson got himself sent off for a last man foul. And I played a player out of position by accident. I didn't notice that I was playing a left winger at centre back until they were 3-1 up. So I was like, oh, great, OK. Because, you know, it's not like we, we generally play all right, even if we have 10 men. But we just got overrun because I was playing someone out of position by mistake. That would have seen us drop to fourth on the final day of the season. Had Cali Thistle, I think it was Cali Thistle, not scored a last minute winner yet, or no, it was Motherwell. So Cali were 2 1 up with like four minutes left, and I was like, oh great, we've dropped to fourth. I then looked at the league table, so we hadn't, and then realised that Matthew Russell had scored an own goal in Motherwell's favour, and that uh, robbed Cali of full points, of, of three points. That meant that we stayed in third, so we could, in theory, have dropped out of the Champions League altogether. Anyway, as you can imagine, uh, 
three defeats on the bounce, no wins in, what, five in the lead-up to the Champions League final. My players' morale was absolutely, you know, it was down. Nobody was happy. It was it was very poor. Yeah, it, we lost 3-2 to Newcastle in the European Cup final. To be fair, though, they went 3-0 up um, by 50 minutes. They scored twice in the first 20, then they scored on 50, and then it looked like we might do it. Enzo scores and netted on 56 minutes. Uh, Gary Stewart gave us hope with a strike on 65. Uh, we bombarded their goal, but we just couldn't find uh, the equaliser. We couldn't find our miracle of Istanbul. Uh, although this would have been the miracle of Gothenburg had we managed to equalise. But with a tired team, a team that was knackered, well actually no, we'd had 10 days rest, so no, we weren't really knackered, but we were, our morale was decimated. As you can see, 10 shots on target. I think we got pretty lucky um, that it was only 3-2, made it quite respectable for us. It was a moral victory almost, because Newcastle actually won the Premier League by uh, no small margin. And they had some good players. As you can see here, they have 31-year-old James Milner. Who else do they have? Steven Taylor, top player on this game. Uh, who else? they got Kasper Schmeichel. they got Tal Benheim and Felipe Mexes, who's got no pace. Neither of them have pace. Anyway, what I realised about the team before we played the final was that um, their team, their average age was about 32 and our average age was about 22. But yeah, we couldn't pull off. We, You know, back-to-back -back Champions Leagues would have been cool. To be fair though, back-to-back -back Champions League finals are actually cool. Um, especially given our poor form towards the back end of the season. And that's the team that ultimately uh, lost the final. But, you know, fair play. Interestingly, Chris Cabo came back from his loan move uh, from Arsenal in time to play the final. And I'd already, like, he was under 21, so I didn't need to register him. So I just threw him in. He was the only player with any sort of morale. But yeah, a bit disappointing. Could be Jonas Johansson's last game for the club. Might not be. He's definitely Luis Rafael's last game for the club. Might be Yaya's last game for the club. The season as a whole wasn't amazing, obviously. It would have been nice to have, well, won a treble again, or a quadruple. It would have been nice to win any trophy besides the European Super Cup and the World Club Championships. But at the end of the day, this just goes to show how monumental the quadruple actually was, given the fact that we were still in every single cup competition by the time we played in the League Cup final. Yeah, so by the 19th of March, we were still in every competition, and in like a two-month period, we'd lost. We'd, we'd not won a single tour a competition. I think we were top of the league at that point when we played the League Cup final, so we were in pole position for four trophies, and we just didn't manage it. You know, we're through to the quarterfinals of the Champions League, through to the semifinals of the Scottish Cup. It just shows how monumental the quadruple actually was when we did it. In terms of the Scotland national team, of course, I showed the European Championships. We got knocked out in the quarterfinals to the hosts Denmark. Disappointed not to have gone further, but there you go. Uh, we started off our World Cup qualification stage in a in a terrible group, my I add. I really don't like this group. Drew with Norway 0-0. Uh, we then beat Armenia 8-0. Uh, Craig Beattie managed to score five goals, just because why not? Uh, he scored on 12 minutes, he scored on 15 minutes, 18 minutes, and on 24 minutes. The first four goals were scored by one player, Craig Beattie. Uh, then Kevin Robertson netted on 50 minutes. And then inside the last 10 minutes, we scored another three to make the score very respectable. Uh, Craig Beattie netted his fifth on 80 minutes. Gary Stewart netted on 89. And Stephen Hamill netted on 90 minutes. I was hoping Craig Beattie might have taken the penalty because he has taken penalties before because that would have given him a double hat-trick had he scored it. But Oh well, we then beat Italy uh, at the Enio Tradini in Parma. Gary Crawford got the winner in 66 minutes. Felipe was set off on 80 minutes, but we managed to hold out for a vital three points away to a good team. Who do they have playing for them? Giorgio Chiellini. He was the only player that I recognised. I'm guessing this guy... Oh, no, he's a regen. Oh, Alberto Aquilani. We all remember him. Well, I do anyway. So the, the, those were the players. Good win against the Italians. Uh, our final group game of this video was a 2-0 win uh, recently in March over Kazakhstan. Gary Crawford netted on 52 minutes and on 72 minutes. He's a good player. Very good player. I was actually after him when he was at Partick, but he ended up at... Well, he ended up down in England, Coventry, and then Southampton. So, yeah. And that's how the group looks. We're the only team not to have conceded. Uh, as you get, the reason I called it a joke group was because there's no really, really weak teams. Uh, Kazakhstan aren't bad. They're not great, but they're not bad. But, you know, teams like Italy, Ukraine, Norway. Ouch. Ouch. I thought I was going to get an easy group because in the world rankings, we're like fifth. So I thought, 
we'll get an easy group. <laughs> no chance. Oh yeah, I'll show you my Champions League group because I never did show you that. There's confirmation that we got to the final. Um, not that you needed it necessarily. Yeah, there we go. So we finished two points clear of Bronby, who obviously drew their last game because we were level in points prior to that. Real Madrid missed out the UEFA Cup spot despite drawing with Bromby. So in terms of the coefficients, we're up to 15. Hopefully having come runners-up in the uh, European Cup will uh, maybe rise a bit higher, but it's obviously going to be even harder to rise like into the top 10 because the top 10 teams are like elite. We'd have to get to the final again and again. Uh, Scotland are fifth, so they should remain fifth because loads of our teams did well getting past the group stage of European competitions and even the first knockout stage at times. In terms of our finances, there's where we lost the 9 mil and we ended up below 5 mil. Um, and then obviously I sold a bunch of players and thanks to getting to the Champions League final once again, we managed to raise our budget again or, or our balance sorry, to 20 million. So we're doing all right. If the stadium's expanded, hopefully it's expanded more than just 3,000, but it'll probably be 15,000 or something like that if I was to guess. Um, but if it's expanded more, that means we'll get more income from our attendances. Of course... In terms of our records, uh, our attendance record was smashed instantly as soon as we expanded the stadium size. As you can see here, our highest attendance was this season in a nil-no draw against Celtic, ironically. But yeah, there's all the competitions that have gone down this season. This friendly cup against Man City never happened. We won two of them. Runners-up in the European Cup and the League Cup. Third in the league. Semi-final of the Scottish Cup. And then obviously we've got the two international tournaments tournaments here the qualification and the, Con the confederations cup is back so lots and lots happening in this game it's definitely been my most action-packed save i've ever had probably my most successful world cup win european cup win not bad but yeah going forward it's going to be interesting um in my 2005 save the next season is the one i got sacked in the 13th season so you know 13 unlucky for some we'll see if i can survive it i my contract's up at the end of the year i'm going to have to have a very good season the board aren't satisfied with the team's final league position and they're only satisfied with my performance as manager so i'm not in their good books i'm also going to have to get rid of some of these players because not all of them are going to be able to feature that's the stats enzo scorza is the only player from the first division winning campaign and uh that goes all the way down to, well, Neil Smith, you'll be leaving. There'll be one or two people leaving at the end of their contract. Also, I've offered Yaya a contract. He still hasn't accepted it. I mean, it's 250 less than what he's getting paid now, so I, I can't understand why, but whatever. So, yeah, join me again next time to find out if I've survived another season, if I've won anything, and what the squad is. We'll just have to wait and see about that. Until next time though, thank you very much for checking out this video. Apologies it might be a bit long, but we shall have to see after editing. Take care. Until next time, bye for now.